Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And the texts for Palm or Passion Sunday, March 28th, 2021, are Isaiah 54 through 9a, Psalm 31, 9 through 16, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and then either Mark 11, 1 through 11, if you're doing um, Palms Sunday, Palm Sunday, or uh, the longer Passion, uh, which could include Mark 14, 1 through 15, 27. So let's just start there. Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday? Uh, Say more. Which one are we going to go with? The, pa pa the Passion or the, or the, the Celebration? Well, what do you like personally is what I'm asking. Are you going <laughs> to... Uh, I set myself up by speaking first, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, with the um, the passion that we have here um, and noting. Um, I took a turn on Pilate's amazement this time. Um, I've often read this text uh, and um, just let Pilate be the bad guy. And uh, in this one, um, I held out on Pilate being amazed and that he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. And so the question that he asked that I paid attention to was why? What evil has he done? And that just seemed to ring with me um, in, in kind of a parallel reading of the crucifixion with the, the death of so many innocent lives uh, at, at the hand of the rulers and the law, uh, um, the lawgivers and those who have uh, the authority to stop and ask the question, why is this person being brought to me? Why is this person accused? Why are you set on the destruction of this life? And the question that that would lead me to wanting us to ask of our community um, is, are we responding? How are we responding to that question? When someone says, why? Do we take that as a moment to sit back and interrogate our response? Or do we just yell with the crowd, crucify him? Don't tell me the facts. I don't want to hear the truth. It just seemed in our present moment, in our present age, that that might be the passion for the community around us uh, that we might linger in. No, I like, with, I'll follow it, up. On I, it was my attempt. It was my attempt in this politically partisan uh, context not to immediately make the lawgiver the enemy. And it just jumped out at me and I was convicted by it. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to follow up on that if to stick with passion that if if this is the text I'll say also the the commentary by Brent Driggers is really important to read indeed the um the question of you know who's located so much of this text has always been about to whom can we assign blame and the church has made some huge mistakes over the years around that and we've made some important corrections but Mark's way of telling the story I think also wants us to recognize that the perversion of justice that takes place here, and some of that is in chapter 14, is on the one hand utterly predictable, and on the other hand involves people who should know better. <laughs> um, and so the, that jealousy that you mentioned, Joy, is so interesting that the that the elites of Jerusalem, and again, this is a really, we're talking about a really narrow slice here of Jerusalem culture who has this power. <laughs> Yes. Um, to hand Jesus over to Pilate with the uh, with the accusations that, that come with that are jealous that, that there's that's really beneath them from the, from the perspective of, of Roman virility and kind of social whatever you know so there's there's something wrong there that religious leaders are feeling jealousy over something like this 
And whoever the crowds or whoever the people are that they're able to assemble are probably people being manipulated. There's probably a small group that there's a sense here of the capacity for people to um, protect their systems, mm -hmm. to protect their privileges, mm -hmm. to do all they can to wall themselves off from a word of God coming from an unlikely source. Mm -hmm. And in this case, if you push this to, to a, a Trinitarian theology, to resist God as well, that there's a, Mark wants us to see this as horrific. I can't believe that this happened, but also there's a sense of, oh yeah, of course this happened. Because mm -hmm. that's what happens when people with power respond with jealousy and fear and self-protectionism. Mm -hmm. And by power, I'm not just talking about rulers like you, I'm saying, and this is a message for preachers and professors in particular, but also folks in churches. Mm -hmm. That'll preach, Matt. Yeah, I, I think uh, I landed on it. You know, often we've done uh, uh, we've done this before, where we have this, you know, a, a very large uh, passage like this. And what is what detail do you land on that 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 strikes you and that you that you want to that you want to dwell in uh, for a little while? And I, if, if sticking with, I have one for the triumphal entry for Palm and one for Passion, but. Uh, the 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 last verse of the passion narrative, uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid, was really striking to me. Um, particularly leaning into Mark's ending or lack thereof, <laughs> and the anxiety around Mark's ending uh, for uh, for historically, uh, and yet. Uh, and yet we have throughout the, the gospel of Mark, uh, a looking forward to, uh, a looking forward to the good news that he's gone ahead of you to Galilee. Uh, and so it's, you know, what do you listen for? What do you, what are you listening for? But just that, um, that Mary Magdalene and the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. And then the very next story that the, that the, the tomb is empty that, that, I don't know, that tension is really striking to me mm -hmm. of see, of, of there's, there's that, that's where the body is supposed to be. And then the next scene, that tomb is empty. And that, that's kind of the theological space that I would preach this, this, this day of, of sitting, of, of looking in that, looking at that tomb and that there's the body and sitting there and then, and then what, what then Easter Sunday would feel like when that tomb is empty. That's, um, that's, that's the homiletical tension I would want from today. That the result is this dead body <laughs> in a tomb and, uh, and yet the discovery on, on Sunday morning is gonna be the absence, the emptiness of that tomb. I, that's, that's where I would sit. Wow. I, I don't think I have, um, I'll, say, I'll say what catches my imagination, <clears throat> excuse me, although I don't know that it's helpful for what I would preach uh, because I would actually preach Palm Sunday, but we'll talk about that text separately. And that is what, over the years, one of the things I learned, I think probably from this podcast is that Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem. And so uh, where did he live? Did he live in Caesarea Philippi or Caesarea Maritima? One of the, so he, what's he doing there with his army? Well, we got a festival called Passover, which celebrates when God set us free from the empire. That's a dangerous time. So he's there with his army, maybe, uh, to stop a rebellion. And that's the opportunity that then the religious leaders use because they're not allowed to put anybody to death only in the Roman Empire. Romans come in and take that power away from the uh, from the locals. But then, you know, the, the perversion is then this group of elites can hand him over and get them to uh, put the one they're jealous of to death. I mean, it, it to me, it's um, thinking, why is Pilate there? Uh, 
really changed how I hear the passion story over the years. Yeah, it's such a dangerous time because it's Passover, because the city is double or quadruple in population. I mean, all of these reasons why the chief priests earlier say, we're going to hand them over, but not during the festival, <laughs> lest there be a riot. And of course, then they find, well, actually, the festival be, provides nice cover, especially if you seize him at night, and especially if you try him at night, and then if you hand him over to Pilate and he's on the cross by 9 a.m., Whenever, most people are probably hungover, I'm guessing, you know, or you had a lot to eat the night before. It's been a big night. And so to help people get a sense of the, um, oh, what's the word I want? Subterfuge. Pardon, subterfuge. Very good. <laughs> I was going to say the, the dastardly aspects of this. And, you know, it's, it's, the, it's year B. So, uh, and, and three of us had Don Jewell as a teacher around Marx. We talk about this a lot, but one of the things that he always liked to do was say, we're so used to seeing the leadership as the worst of the worst. He said, but to everybody watching, they were the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean that the best of the best are the ones responsible for this? So before you try to take, make them into easy foils, this is what you were doing earlier, Joy. Um, I think that's especially true with the leadership. I, Pilot might have been one of the worst of the worst, but you know, for the sake of proclamation, yeah, that, that's a different question and a way of, of encountering the story for people of faith to take really seriously. Well, and then I, maybe I'll connect us then to Palm in that uh, the Palm Sunday, because the verse that, that again, popped out at me was uh, verse 11. Uh, not, not, you know, not the, 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 branches part, but the, um, he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, then he goes out. But that, just that moment when he looked around at everything, uh, is, is, is that, that coming into Jerusalem at this point, uh, and of course, you know, we know what, what will happen, what will be the results of this, uh, in, you know, in the next, um, yeah, yeah, hours, but, but just, he looked around at everything. What did he see? Um, and of course you get the cleansing of the temple, but it's just that, that naming or that, that moving into that challenge of power uh, or challenge of, of corruption or um, of really calling that out. And it's, and uh, that, the, that the whole passion narrative speaks to of that, uh, of that reality. But uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I think that moment is really something. <laughs> I just say that it's the same verb that gets used in the beginning of chapter three, when he heals the man with the withered hand, mm. where he asks, can I heal him on the Sabbath? And he looks around at the leaders around him. It's wow. this idea yeah. of, yeah, it's not an innocent looking around. To, yeah, it's, exactly. It's a kind of glaring. And then immediately after he heals that man is when they first decide we've got to get rid of him, the Pharisees yeah. and the Rodians together. Yeah. But that, yeah, I, that's, oh, thanks for that connection. But yeah, that, what does he see? What does Jesus see? What, and, and then going back to your comment, Joy, like, what, it, or what do we see? Yeah. Uh, or what are we unwilling to see? Mm -hmm. uh, which, which really ties back to uh, the op uh, Jesus opening verses in the gospel of the kingdom of God has come near. Yes. Uh, repent and believe. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see it or not? Yeah. Uh, and, and what is it that you see? And so that we're, we're in that's we're that's the moment we're in at the at Palm Sunday is what is it what is it that we see about the entirety of this event as not just uh as not only the death of Jesus but the the calling out of empire and in in, in uh, Mark 11 a verse uh, that asked another why question um why are you doing this and the question that I would draw back uh, to the listeners is for whatever it is we're doing, can we say the Lord has need of our action? For, for whatever we are doing, when, when, when asked, are we able to say God needs this? 
that 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 truth telling in that moment mm -hmm. that was the why in the um, in interrogation so what what is the cult that you are untying for the lord joy pardon me what is the cult that you are untying for the lord right right <laughs> i like that yeah yeah so or, hey, I, well, where where is your ass tied up that's a better question for me <laughs> Yeah, I'm surprised Ralph didn't say that. Good one. Um, if I had s said it, I would not have asked that of you, Joy. I would have asked it of myself. <laughs> uh, so I'm a Palm Sunday person, and so are you, Caroline. Uh, didn't you once have a, people might be able to find somewhere uh, an article you wrote on that? I did. It was a long time ago, but it was uh, making the case for Palm Sunday. And it was where? Um, Christian Century. All right. So they can, they can look that up. One yeah. reason I'm for Palm Sunday, um, as opposed to Passion Sunday, I understand why it's helpful maybe to read the whole Passion narrative because people don't come to Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday like they used to, especially in this year. But I'm still a Palm Sunday person, um, partially because I think Palm Sunday um, does, if Palm Sunday does two things. First of all, it makes a memory. Uh, a liturgical memory that lasts a lifetime that the, that Holy week starts with Palm Sunday. And then you get the, the stuff that happens in the temple, the rest of the week. And then of course, Thursday, Friday, um, and Sunday. Um, and I think that th those liturgical memories, you know, are uh, really important. So, so, so that we all go, what's the song Caroline for Palm Sunday? All glory, laud and honor. Mm -hmm. and, and so that you've got a song that goes with it and a word Hosanna. Um, and I do think that, that the, the rhetorical notion that um, the crowds who shout Hosanna become the crowds who shout crucify him. I think that that says something about our human nature um, mm -hmm. that I still think is theologically really important. Um, some, sometimes that gets trite and overdone, but I, um, how, I mean, um, how much do we love it to have heroes and how much is it awesome when heroes fall, you know, and that there's, there's a schadenfreude and a joy in another person's fall that um, is really awful in our nature. I like a good Palm Sunday as well, but I recognize the need to make it Passion Sunday. I would just say briefly about Mark 11. If I was uh, preaching this, I would, I would follow Brent Driggers and his commentary and explore what kind of a king is, is being presented here and take that kingship imagery that's throughout Mark uh, 11, one through 11, that's also there when Jesus is before Pilate, it's there when they hang uh, King of the Jews over, uh, over him on the cross and explore that what kind of king, but I would do that in the context of the writing of Mark's gospel. I would pull people into imagining what it's like around the year 70 probably when Christians are wondering after the end of the great revolt, what do we do? Are, or do we carry up the revolutionary cause on our own? Uh, are we disappointed because Christ hasn't returned? Do we become more conciliatory? Do we kind of find a way to ingratiate ourselves to Rome? And, and Mark's answer to that, and this is a lot of ways draws from, from Brian Blunt's work on, on Mark and the book he co-wrote with Gary Charles, but the answer is instead uh, to find a different kind of leader, one who resists empire, one who's utterly consistent with uh, the Jewish practices of old, but represents a way going forward of um, uh, of power through through the horror of a cross in all of the irresolvable tensions that those images create to see a king who's crucified. Mm 